right now, traditionally that has been a one-way road. That's been information coming from the laboratories out into the farming community. And I think what we need to have, because so much experimentation is going on now, so many farmers are coming up with their own ideas, we need a way to connect farmers one, farmer to farmer so that we have an information system where a farmer in, say, my part of the state can learn about something that's going on down in Texas and vice versa and share information. Because there's, you know, right now we've got people who may have solved a huge problem that no one else knows about. Um, and those, that kind of information needs to be shared. I think that's the system we need to be working on. So in addition to repairing that extension service, we need to find a way to extend the extension service. of genetically modified organisms into this industrialization of food, something that's going to make those problems even worse? Um, uh, I, listen, I, I don't have, I don't, I spent a lot of time looking at this and I haven't found any evidence that there are serious health problems associated with GM foods. I mean, we don't have any long-term studies yet, so there may be effects that will show up. Mostly what you hear is anecdotal. People saying, oh, I got an allergic reaction because I had this, and it may be the case, but we don't have, and, and people have spent a lot of time looking, like the Union of Concerned Scientists has spent a lot of time looking at this because this is something that's a hot button issue and they're not finding anything. So, I, there, are, but there are a couple of other concerns with GM foods. One is that it's possible that you will create a, a genetic product that will get out. You know, and right now we're already having farmers who are, say, using GM corn, pollen from their crop is infecting someone who wants to have GM free or even organic, and it ruins their whole crop. They're pretty much shot for the whole year because they can no longer sell their crop as a premium. There are concerns like that, and then there's concerns, and the biggest concern for me is that these GM products are expensive. They really, you know, and only farmers in, you know, North America, some parts of South America, and Europe can afford them. Of course, Europe doesn't allow many GM products. They exclude a lot of the farmers that really need help with new seeds. I mean, the truth is, American corn farmers don't need G any more g genetic modification. I mean, they're producing a lot of corn. They really don't need any improvements. Or not, so the people that need improvements are the folks who are in, say, Kenya, who could use a kind of corn that was drought tolerant. That's where we could use some genetic help. And yet, they can't afford to, for, to pay for the seeds. So, to me, what the genetic modification revolution has done is it's, it's totally moved research toward the one group that really doesn't need it and is abandoning those groups that really do need research help. Now, if, if sometime in the next 50 years, or 25 years or five years, we determine that GM has, poses a significant health risk, then we have to, you know, it has to go by the wayside. But right now, I think there's potentially a great benefit to come from genetic modification. Maybe not in necessarily genetic modifying it, but, but using um, genetic tools to speed up traditional breeding. You know, there's, there's a huge potential there. But again, the point is that those tools aren't being used by, you know, uh, in the interest of the people that really need it. There are farmers who can produce 175 bushels of corn an, uh, an acre are now looking for ways to produce 180 bushels. I mean, it just, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And that to me is the biggest risk that it sort of distracts us from the real prize. Good question. Hello. Well, <laughs> sorry. That's okay, it must be a good question. Uh, you mentioned the problem of um, inadequate grocery stores and, and um, basically as a, struggle of, yeah, just adequate grocery stores. And um, we in town have, you know, networks such as uh, Siempre Sustainable, who are a network of uh, community gardens. Um, and luckily we have the space um, here that, that our city, you know, is welcoming to, to those networks. And to go back on the grocery store, actually, you know, if we split this town in half, uh, the east side of town has about three or four grocery stores as the east side has none, and so that's kind of a statistic. Wow. Uh, that's basically what, what the situation has been in this town, you know, since I'm 23 years old and it's always been that way. Um, but I was uh, wondering to ask you about um, the community gardens in terms of city planning. Um, like I mentioned, you know, Seguin is actually, ha has been very receptive to it, but then you have other, you know, bigger cities with bigger industri in industry and where that, where that kind of marriage might not be so happy. Um, and so I was wondering basically if you just had suggestions based on that struggle that's going to continue to 
uh, occur with the pro progressive cities that are creating these right. um, these networks of, of community gardens, but that are also going to be have those industries um, above their heads. You know? Or, or just basically, they're they're struggling with how do you fit in urban horticulture into an urban setting where it traditionally hasn't been there. And you know, there's there's all there's a, there, there's some pretty innovative ideas about this. There are. There are, right now, in many places, we, we condition development on a developer's willingness to build roads, build infrastructure, build water system, build sewer system. And it might be that we would say, OK, we'd also like you to include some garden space. You don't have to grow the garden, but we'd like to allow residents to have that option. So we're, and then there's actually, there's developments, there's, there's some rest homes you know, uh, for senior citizens that are being built with horticulture in there because they found this great connection between, I mean, it's a generation that actually knows how to garden, A, but it's also, there are some, there are some social and health benefits that come from, so there's, there's finding ways to sort of include horticulture, but in the built community, that is the community that's already there, it's sometimes difficult to fit in urban horticulture, and you sometimes have to wait for an existing use to fade, and then you have to approach, you know, the planning commission and say, by the way, and you're right, you're competing with a lot of different uses. And the truth is that if you're in an urban setting, real estate values may be so high how are you going to justify putting a garden there? And that's what's tough. That's why some people are looking at this rooftop thing, so that you have a business down below that's sort of paying for the space, and then you have everything else is just gravy. But it's going to take a lot of creativity, and it's going to take a lot of people sitting in, plan in, in city councils and planning sessions, which is not what people think about when they think about reforming the food system. They think it's out there with a hoe, you know? Um, and a lot of it has to do with sitting through long meetings. So, um, but it's, it's exactly right. It's, that tension is going to be ongoing. And, and a lot of the and a lot of the the city planners have been. I mean, I've just kind of talking about this with with friends of mine from various cities. A lot of what they run into is uh, it, oh, it's an issue of code. It's an issue of code. Right. With city planners, and so that, that's amazing. Well, and, there, and a lot of times it's unfamiliar for city planners. They're saying they don't know what what are the risks. What happens if we allow them to grow celery in the city limits? Is this going to be you know a major health issue? Um, Certainly livestock, you know. I mean, where I live, in, in the town I live in, it's a small town, there's a three chicken rule. You can have three hens, and you can't have a rooster, and that's sort of the compromise that they've come up with, you know. So, um, which, it seems reasonable, because your neighbor may not want to be woken at the crack of dawn, or all night, as the case may be, but um, it is tough, because it's finding a way, you know, we've gotten so used to not having food anywhere near us, in terms of its production, that the, the, everyone says, oh, I'm totally in favor of bringing it back into the city, just not in my backyard, you know, just not anywhere I have to look at it. I wouldn't want my daughter to marry one. You know, that's pretty much what it comes down to. So it's a culture thing. It's sort of, you know, it's not just the planning commission and the planners that need to be sort of brought on. It's, it's neighbors as well. It's a good question. We have a person at each mic, so we'll take those questions, and then we'll uh, call it a night. Um, I, I come from a traditionally Polish community, and there's a lot of traditional Polish diet that still goes on there. But as you move out to areas that are more um, bigger cities or even medium-sized cities, you find that there's not as much. Do you think that the um, uh, mass production of cattle and chickens has affected the culture of American eating? I think it has because. That's, that's a really good example because you have communities that have very strong ties. And yet, Polish cooking or any kind of cooking requires time and skill. And as your time becomes more precious and as, become, and as alternatives make their, it's harder and harder to stick to those traditional skills. Um, and sooner or later, they get eroded. And, I, and finding ways to, um, you know, humans, I mean, you know what optimal foraging strategy is. It's sort of the thing that, you know, the human animal goes for the most calories for the least effort. It's sort of what we do. It's why we survive for so long. And now we're in a position where it doesn't take much effort to get a lot of calories. And so you know, it allows us to do other things. And going back to those sort of traditional practices is hard. It takes a decision. A lot of what we're talking about takes a deliberate decision. You have to, you know, the, the sort of the decline in our food culture hasn't been by plan. We haven't said, geez, in 10 years from now, I'd like to be cooking nothing. You know, and I'd like to be really unhealthy, and I'd like to never see my kids at dinner table. No one ever, well, at least I don't know anyone that sort of <laughs> makes that declaration. What happens is it's just incremental. It's sort of like you boil the frogs slowly, and they don't realize they're being boiled. Well, we're pretty much done, you know. And the way to reverse that, or one way, is to be deliberate, to understand that we're not just going to sort of accidentally get ourselves out of this. It's going to have to be choices. So the industrial system is going to motor on. It's got its own inertia. 
And the, the only way to, to get, sort of get in its way is to be deliberate about it. So it's making those choices to say, all right, I'm going to go back and recover some of those traditional practices. Probably not all of them, but some of them. But it takes, it's a deliberate action. That's a good question. Hi. Hello. Um, I was, we've spoken a lot this evening about uh, groups of humans, uh, ethical, uh, the ethical implications against their actions against other groups of humans. So I was wondering if you could touch for a bit on um, humans' actions on the animals in the food industry and the suffering that the animals experience in the food industry process up until um, they're ready to be eaten Well, thanks for the easy question at the end of the. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after you, you know, sometimes you'll be looking at your food and you realize what you're looking at. It's a piece of an animal if you're eating meat. And you can hope that the animal was ta well taken care of and didn't suffer too much. But you know, if you are aware at all, that the process by which we raise our livestock and process them is not generally ethical or very gentle. And. You know, there's a big push. Many people say, look, we're just, I'm, you know, I don't believe in eating any meat at all because it's one way to sort of solve that. The tough part about that is that there's a couple of issues that need to be considered. I'm all for being a vegetarian, I, and I respect that as, a, as an alternative, but I want people to consider a couple of things. First of all, I mean, in this country, it's possible to get all the nutrients you need without touching an animal. We understand that. We have the education. We have the resources. In other countries, it's not always the case. Okay, in some poor countries, meat is one of the quickest ways to improve the diet and living standards. So we have to be very, we, and, and, and their, their, their practices may not be terribly ethical, at least by our standards. So we have to be careful about recommending that they change their meat standards. I think the other issue is that even if we stopped eating meat, all of us worldwide, we found another way to deal with protein, we still need to have animals on the landscape. They still need to be part of the process. Uh, a, a landscape without animals is a landscape that's sterile. It doesn't work. You have to have that nutrient cycle. And so one of the challenges in the future will be finding a way to have that complete landscape with animals in an entirely ethical way. Maybe we just have herds of animals that just exist there and we sort of wave as we drive by, but the point is they're there. But, but, but we're gonna have to find a way to do that in a way that's fair and just to the animals as well. So it's really tough. You know, some, some people view us as we're an animal, we were designed for meat consumption. I mean, there's, there's a big school of thought that would suggest that. And for them, the question is, if they even think about it at all, it's they say, well, there's probably a better way to treat the animals, but you know, do, you, do, we, do we criticize a lion for being mean to the zebra? And there's other people that say, no, no, that's part of being human is we, we, we're above that, and we can make that choice. And that's, I think, one of the things we're going to have to get, one of the questions we're really going to have to struggle with. But as we struggle with it, we have to recognize that animals cannot be just sort of subtracted from the equation. They're going to have to be part of the system. And I think maybe the challenge is to find a way to put them in the system in a way that's ethical and fair and, and nice to the animals and is sustainable for us. Because again, meat is one of the big sort of sources of the problems in the food system. So thanks very much for the questions and the time. And good luck the rest of the year, you guys. <laughs>